Good morning, everyone. Thank you for coming to Acts Reform Fellowship today to worship Jesus and to uh, just give honor and praise to our Savior. Thank you for those that have come today. Let's bow our heads and pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for all your blessings throughout the week and today, Lord. I just pray, Lord, that you would help us focus on today's message, Lord, that you would encourage us, Lord God, and that you would be with our brother, Lord, that is going to be preaching the word today. Thank you for the worship team, Lord. Please prepare our hearts, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.
in our souls to receive today's message from you, that you would remind us of our need to cry out to you as the divine son of David, to please have mercy on us, to please come and dwell with us. We ask this now, Lord, in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. Let's take a couple minutes to say grace and peace to each other.
Father, thank you for the time of worship. We ask that your Holy Spirit may be with us as we learn from your word today. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Stan. Thank you, worship team. Just some announcements today before we get started, started excuse me, and hear today's message. So today, uh, I want to invite everybody after service as well. Uh, we're going to be, uh, I guess you wouldn't say celebrating, but wishing off uh, one of our members here that's going to be moving out of state. So we want to invite you to the Red Robin in San Dimas. Now, additional announcements is... Throughout the week, uh, we have many ways to be involved with Acts Reformed Church. Uh, you're more than welcome to come on Tuesdays where we have a community group where we come together. Uh, we break bread with one another once a month. We get into God's Word. And it's a great time to invite people that have not come to church or uh, have questions about what the Bible teaches. Now, we also have a men's study on Tuesdays that starts at 6 p.m. I want to encourage you if you're a man and, and you want to be very transparent and get godly counsel, uh, it's where it's a great time to confess sin and be around other brothers. The women meet as well. That's on Thursdays. That's at 7 p.m. right here. The women also meet on Saturday mornings at 5 a.m. right here. As we know, uh, prayer is very important. Now, I was just here this Friday for Theology Fridays. It was a great turnout. I want to encourage you to come every other Friday here at 7.30. So here is a great opportunity. You have a question about what we believe here at Acts Reformed Church or what the Bible teaches, come here on Fridays, every other Friday, and ask those questions. Um, with further ado, we have uh, our brother and one of our pastors that's going to be leading today in our scripture and our study. Thank you. Thank you, Alan. So we are now in the chapter in chapter six of Mark. So let's uh, let's stand up and read God's word. Mark chapter six, the first six verses, one through six. As we make our way through through the Gospel of Mark. I encourage you to, uh, during the week, whatever chapter we're on, if you could just read that chapter uh, during the week. That way, when we come to the sermon, uh, we are uh, familiarized with the text that is being um, read and explained. So, for instance, next week, as Pastor Kevin preaches Mark Starting in verse 7, we could be more familiar. So that's just an encouragement for you guys. So starting in verse 1 of chapter 6, it says, He went away from there and came to his hometown, and his disciples followed him. And on the Sabbath, he began to teach in the synagogue. And many who heard him were astonished, saying, where did this man get these things? What is the wisdom given to him? How are such mighty works done by his hands? Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, and the brother of James, and Joseph, and Judas, and Simon? And are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. 
And Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor except in his hometown and among his relatives and in his own household. And he could do no mighty work there except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. And he marveled because of their unbelief. And he went about among the villages teaching. This is the word of the Lord. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, as we look at your word this morning, as we look at the questions that were asked about you, about you, Lord Jesus, in your hometown, I pray that we would reflect, that we would know the answers to those questions and that we would not be predisposed to reject those answers, but that we would be touched by you, by your truth, by your gentle love and mercy and grace toward us so that we would be part of your kingdom, part of your family. Lord, I pray that the hearers this morning would be encouraged, would be convicted, would be edified by your word. And I pray that you would help me, Lord, as I share this scripture and explain it, that you would be with me as I do so for your people and your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right, let us be seated. Okay, so in studying this passage, I thought that an appropriate title for, for the message as a whole would be The Questions of Unbelief. The majority of this text, or the main emphasis of this text, centers around questions that the people asked about Jesus. Now, prior to, to this occurrence here in chapter 6, we come from analyzing and looking at some of the things that Jesus had just, has just done throughout Galilee and Capernaum, where he had his headquarters when he began his earthly ministry, right around Galilee and Capernaum. And throughout that region, he had been teaching as well as performing miracles. Some of the healing miracles that we've recently studied and looked at is in the sermon last week. Pastor Cameron preached on that. How a woman who was suffering from bleeding for 12 years was made well by Jesus. He also healed in the same passage a young girl, Jairus' daughter, not only healed her, but he actually resurrected her from the dead because she died. Jesus also, before that, healed a demon-possessed man who would have otherwise been condemned to live the rest of his life to be tortured by demons. Some other miracles before that that are attested to here in, in the book of Mark are an instance in which Jesus shows his Authority over a violent storm. And by speaking, by commanding, the sea and the wind obeyed him. And then before that, we learned how Jesus was preaching and teaching with the emphasis on faith. How one ought to have faith. And he did that through teaching through parables. We saw the, the parable of the mustard seed. We saw the parable of the lamp not to be put under a cover so that the light wouldn't um, so that the light would not be obstructed. We saw the parable of the sower and how the seed of the word of God falls among different soils. So in all those things, after Jesus was teaching. What he was doing is he was demonstrating his lordship over nature, over demons and the spiritual, and over death. In all those things, Jesus is saying, I am Lord of all those things. I am the ruler. And what we found thus far is that after learning the teachings about having faith, 
the disciples, even themselves, when they were revealed to, that they were chosen, they were given the understanding to know the things of God, even they, right after that, doubted during the storm in the Sea of Galilee. Yet in contrast, we see the woman who had the bleeding disease, who perhaps had heard about Jesus, right? Because she knew that if she would just come to him and touch him, that she would be, she would be healed. We see the contrast there that she had faith and she was made well. She was healed by Jesus. So some have faith, some don't have faith. Some trust in what Jesus can do and some do not. Why? Why is that? In the passage today, the first six verses of Mark, chapter 6, we learn that Jesus comes back now to his own hometown where he was raised, Nazareth. And what he finds is unbelief. Not only from his half-brothers and sisters in the blood, but also from the general public at large there in Nazareth. As far as his family is concerned, we learned earlier in Mark 3.21 that his half-brothers and sisters, they were worried about him. They cared about him. And the, the text tells us there in uh, verse 21 in chapter 3 that they literally thought that Jesus had lost his mind because of all the controversy, the polemic around Jesus, the religious rulers trying to come after him. And in showing genuine care and love for their brother, they wanted to, hey, come on, let's go home. You know, it's time to go. Come, be safe. Don't expose yourself to that danger of being targeted by the powerful of the time. They thought that Jesus lost his mind. So we know that his family, aside from Mary, his mother, his family were non-believers. Now being back in Nazareth where he grew up, his fame had inevitably spread. Capernaum and the Sea of Galilee, that region is about 25 miles away from Nazareth. So it's not that far. It's probably a half a day's walk. And word had gone out that this guy named Jesus, who was originally from Nazareth, had been around preaching and teaching and apparently performing miracles. However... When he does come to see his hometown, he is received with much dis disbelief. Now the opponents of Jesus who come here into the scene, they're presenting certain objections to Jesus. And they present these in a series of questions. The questions they ask, as we will see, on the surface may have some merit. Well, you know, we need to know who this guy is to see if his claims have any val validity. Even us, we could picture ourselves being in a certain situation if somebody comes with some sort of authoritative teaching. I want to know where this guy is from, where he learned these things, who he is. However, when we analyze the questions, as we will see, we start to notice that they oppose Jesus with these questions, but it's just a front, it's just a small screen, a false excuse. As to why they reject Jesus. And this is what Tyler's message is. The questions of unbelief. This would be the questions. The objections that come up. To trusting in Jesus. So I guess the first realization here would be. At one point. Did you have questions of unbelief. Towards Jesus. Or maybe today you still do. I know that before God saved me. For sure, I had many questions, intellectual questions about God, the nature of evil, the actual existence of Jesus in history, is the Bible reliable, etc., etc. But in retrospect, what are we really thinking? What are really our motives and reasons for those questions? What is really the reason for unbelief? We must ask ourselves that today. What are the motives, the true motives of having questions of unbelief towards Jesus? 
Is it truly an academic and intellectual exercise in order to test truth, in order to see if those things make sense? Or is it just a farce? Is it just a front so that we can, we can keep living the way we want to live without having any accountability to a holy and righteous God? So with that in mind, let us dig into the text. Verse 1 tells us that Jesus went away and came to his hometown, and his disciples followed him. So as Jesus retreats from the Sea of Galilee, he comes to Nazareth. Even though Jesus was born in Bethlehem, Nazareth is described as his hometown, since Joseph and Mary moved to Nazareth. And in many instances in the Bible, Jesus is referred to as Jesus of Nazareth. We recall in, in particular one instance in the book of John, chapter 1, when Philip comes and he tells Nathaniel, hey, we found him. We found the one. And he tells him, it's Jesus of Nazareth. And what is Nathaniel's response? Hmm, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Why? Because Nazareth was a very small village, relatively insignificant. Nazareth is not even mentioned in the Old Testament. So it's, it doesn't have a sort of reputation for great prophets or kings or rulers coming from that region. So in a sense, Nazareth being so small, we know that at that time it was probably around 500 inhabitants. Jesus growing there, it would be a place looked upon as something of a lower class, something inferior to the other regions. So in that sense, the phrase Jesus of Nazareth could even be used as a derogatory term, derogatory expression towards those from Nazareth, especially for Jesus. Now, a word about modern Nazareth. I've had the privilege of visiting Nazareth a couple of occasions. And what we see is that today, that city, it's, it's grown now, right? It's more of a, a large town, a city is populated mostly by Arab Muslims. And there is a huge amount of tourism, a lot of pilgrimage that passes through there. So it's a, it's a place of a lot of commerce, a lot of moving, a lot of people, many shops, restaurants, etc. And unfortunately what you see there, as it is true also in Israel in general, you see a lot of, a lot of idolatry from the pilgrimage that comes through there. A lot of exercise of um, you know, rituals and superstition at all these different sites. And Nazareth not being an exception. Especially because there, uh, up in the hill, there's a church, a Roman Catholic church, called the Church of the Annunciation. It is believed that at that spot is where the angel Gabriel appeared to Mary and gave her the news that she was going to give birth to Jesus. So in that spot, it is um, a holy site that is believed to have been that place where the angel appeared to Mary, and they, they built a Catholic church there. Now, inside that, uh, that building, there's also a first century adobe-like built hut that tradition believes that that's the actual house where the Holy Family lived, where Jesus were uh, to grow up. Now, is that really the place? We don't know. I would say I don't know for sure. That would be my personal take. However, because that is such a, it was such a small village, we know that if it was not there, the place where it was, it's literally a rock's throw from there. So it's not that far off. Just to think that you're walking and standing in the place where Mary got that announcement from the angel. And that's where if you were taken back in time and you would stand there, you would literally see Jesus walking around. That's pretty amazing. And maybe that's the reason why a lot of people are taken further by that and find an exit in, in worshiping the place 
and putting superstition in the place rather than on Christ alone. So anyway, regardless of that, I think it shows the validity of Scripture and how it speaks of actual places and actual people in history. Something interesting, lastly, here about modern-day Nazareth, as you walk up to that hill, you have to go through, uh, through a, a narrow street, and there's a giant billboard that is on there that you can't miss. It's right there. And it's a, a warning sign by our Muslim friends telling us to not blaspheme God by believing in three gods and by saying that Allah does not have a son. Obviously, this is a misunderstanding of the true nature of the true God from our Muslim friends. And what is interesting is that nevertheless, aside from that welcome sign, uh, they are very friendly because they have businesses there. So they want you to eat at the restaurants and, and buy at their shops. So I found that pretty interesting. So in any case, the last part of this verse says that the disciples followed him to his hometown. And I think uh, a key takeaway from, from the last portion of the verse is that as the disciples are still learning and developing their faith, they still have a devotion to Jesus. They will follow him wherever he goes. And how that relates to us, as subtle as a takeaway that that may be from that, that small portion of the verse, is that we too need to be devout followers of Jesus to wherever that may lead. We cannot say, yes, I follow Jesus, but I choose only to follow him in certain aspects. No, there's no such thing. If we are to be disciples of Christ, we are to stand with him. Why Jesus said, if you love me, you will follow my commandments. So we cannot claim allegiance to Jesus, but not follow him in his teachings of obedience to be separate, to be holy. So that's a, a reminder and an encouragement for us. So verse 2 says that on the Sabbath, he began to teach in the synagogue. And many who heard him were astonished, saying, Where did this man get these things? What is the wisdom given to him? How are such mighty works done by his hands? In previous sermons, we have discussed how Jesus would be invited and allowed to teach at the synagogues. Now, we do know that no one, um, not just anyone, could walk up to a synagogue and, and give a message. You actually had to have permission. You had to be invited. So there we know that somehow Jesus had favor with the leaders of the synagogue. And that favor could have been genuine. But also, it is also evident that many of these invitations or allowing him to speak might be as a result of people wanting to catch him or to twist what he was saying in order to attack him and in order to bring accusations against him. So anytime he would speak publicly, any critics of his would be on the lookout, on the alert to see if he would say something they could take and twist and later use against him. <coughs> but why were the people so astonished when they heard him? It says when they heard these things, they were astonished. Let us recap some of the things that we know that Jesus taught publicly. First, we know that he would teach as one having authority. He wouldn't say, thus says Rabbi such and such. He would not say, thus says the Lord. But he would say, it is written, or he would say, I tell you. Meaning that he didn't point to any authority outside himself. And that was very, very unusual in the context of teaching in the Jewish culture at the time. He didn't point to any higher authority other than himself. Secondly, we know that he would rebuke the religious. In one occasion, Jesus said, you search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. But it is those very scriptures that testify of me. Right? So, who does he think he is? The scriptures that we've been reading and studying and devoted to our whole lives? He's saying that they're about him? No way. And Jesus would rebuke him in that. Which leads to the third point, that Jesus would tell them that the whole scripture 
Moses, the law, the prophets, the Psalms, Jesus said, are about me. They testify of me. And another aspect of Jesus' teaching is that he would make claims that can be attributed only to God, to Jehovah God. Jesus would say, your sins are forgiven. And what would the people say? Well, how dare he say that? Who can forgive sins but God alone? And basically, Jesus was like, that's right. <laughs> so when people would hear these things being taught by Jesus, they were astonished. Based on this, the audiences would say, who does he think he is? How can he speak like this? The language used here for astonished is their minds were literally blown. That's what we would use in our common, our common modern terminology. They were puzzled at how Jesus could speak with such power, with charisma, with authority, but yet without any credible account of where is he getting this wisdom? Where is he getting this teaching? Where is he coming from? And here comes the first set of questions of unbelief. Where, what, and how? Where is this man getting these things? What is the wisdom given to him? How are such mighty works done by his hands? Where, what, and how? The first three questions of unbelief. Now, we have to notice that in these questions, there's two keys. One, there's no denial of the evidence. And two, the questioners are predisposed to not accept an answer. Okay? So, let us take a look at that. No denial of the evidence. There's no, no denial that great things have been preached. There's no denial that the wisdom of Jesus is great wisdom. They couldn't catch him in his words. They tried to. They couldn't. And when he would respond, he would leave them without an answer. And there's no denial of the mighty works being done by him. Healing people. Resurrecting people. Casting out demons. There's no denial. And then they're predisposed to not accept any answer. How can this be so? For instance, if these questioners were told, well, these things that Jesus teaches come from God. His wisdom comes from God. And the works and miracles being done by His hands are the works done by the actual hands of God here on earth. Do you think the questioners would have been satisfied with that answer? No. They're predisposed to reject the answers. So then we move on to verse 3. It says, continuing with the questioning, Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, and brother of James and Joseph and Judas and Simon? And are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. So the second set of questions also have a couple of keys to them. The first one is, they're questioning downplays the identity of Jesus. And secondly, they therefore proceed to personal attacks. So the first one, they question and downplay the identity of Jesus. They're basically saying, there's nothing special about this man. Not only is he a mere human, but he's actually of a lower class than many of us educated folks. They say, isn't, is, isn't he just a carpenter? The word there is tecton, which is described as somebody who worked with their hands. Typically, either a woodworker or even with stone. And they're basically saying, isn't he just, you know, somebody who works with his hands? He's not from any distinguished, educated family. And then, they are coming and saying, 
that they know his family. They're, they're right there. He has brothers and sisters, just like any regular guy would. <coughs> There's really nothing special about him. Right? They obviously know the names of, of his siblings. And here also, as a side note, it's inevitable to make the comment that this serves as a reminder that Mary, being highly favored by God the Father, she was a servant of God, chosen to be the mother of Jesus. However, she was not, as some religious traditions have made her out to be, a perpetual virgin. She was not. Scripture is clear on that. Mary and Joseph proceeded, proceeded to have children after the miraculous virgin birth of Jesus. And this is one passage in which we are told that Jesus had half-brothers and sisters. At least five brothers and at least two sisters. So, after downplaying who Jesus is, he's just a normal guy. Like, how could this be? We know his family. They're, they're here with us. Then they go to personal attacks. Have you ever been in a conversation heated conversation where there's really nothing else for the person that you're disagreeing with to say and they turn out to personal attacks, right? At homonym attacks. And as we will see here, it may not be as obvious reading it through our modern lenses, but let's take a look at what they're actually telling Jesus. They're saying, isn't this just a son of Mary? In Jewish tradition, one would identify from the father's side of the family. So it would say the son of, you know, such and such. But here they identify him as the son of Mary. This was insinuating that Jesus was born as an illegitimate, illegitimate child to Mary because she got pregnant before being married. To illustrate this, we can look at John 8, chapter, chapter 8, verses 18 and 19. And I'll just read it there for you. It says, Jesus speaking in having this conf confrontation with the Pharisees. It says, I am the one who bears witness about myself, and the Father who sent me bears witness about me. They said to him, therefore, Where is your Father? Jesus answered, You know neither my Father... For if you knew me, you would know my father also. And then he gets even more heated. Uh, John 8, same chapter, and then verses 39 to 41. It says, They answered him, Abraham is our father. Jesus said to them, If you were Abraham's children, you would be doing the works of, that Abraham did. They said to him, Note, We are not born of sexual immorality. We have one Father, even God. See that? So there was this rumor, this uh, gossip, this contention going on that Jesus was an illegitimate child, that he was born out of wedlock, that um, Mary had been um, gotten pregnant out of wedlock, rather. And then a couple of verses after that, is where Jesus actually just lets them have it. And he says, you know what? You're actually sons of the devil. And you are doing the works of Satan. Right? So many times we have the notion that Jesus was like this surfer dude, long hair, never heard to fly. No. Nope. He would come and, and bring it. Right? So Jesus, think about this. Jesus, God manifested in the flesh comes here and is experiencing the harsh humiliation of his own creation telling him you're actually a bastard you have no room here with us you're nobody when scripture tells us that Jesus being God emptied himself and he made himself for a little while lower than the angels. We need to be reminded of what that means. Condescending himself. Humiliating himself. In order to come and accomplish the work of redemption. We need to, to really marvel at that. 
and not take that lightly. So then it says, notice, after all this, they took offense at him. Who are the ones offending? Who are the ones throwing all this insults at Jesus? It's them. But yet it says that they were, they're the offended ones now, right? The word offense here in the Greek is scandalon, like a scandal or a stumbling block. And it says that they were repelled by Jesus. Even though they were the ones actively offending Jesus, yet now they're the offended ones. So let us be real with this. I mean, let's use this to help manage our expectations. Should we be surprised that people are offended at the message of Jesus? Should we be surprised that at the hearing and preaching of the gospel, the preaching about Jesus, that people are going to reject? No. Jesus said, if they hate you, they hated me first. If they reject you, they rejected me. So we should not be surprised that people are offended by the message of Jesus. So what is the message of Jesus that is so offensive? It's basically the opposite of what the world says, of what culture says. It's the opposite of what we would want to believe naturally. Now, we ought to be careful that we are not to be offensive because of our personality or because we're you know, arrogant or we're jerks when we're sharing the gospel. Because people are going to be offended by the gospel. So let it not be that they're offended because you're being a bad witness. So that's a reminder for us. Nevertheless, what is it that's offensive? It's basically that it's a message that is countercultural. It goes everything that we naturally want to believe. Culture tells you you're basically a good person. You deserve the best. But the gospel says you're actually morally corrupt. You're a horrible person and you deserve God's judgment. Culture tells you Seek self-fulfillment. Be happy. Seek happiness. The gospel tells you, nope, seek the kingdom of God and His righteousness and all the other things will be added on to you. Culture tells you, follow your heart. Follow your dreams. The gospel tells you, nope, your heart is wicked. Desperately wicked above all things. Follow Jesus instead. Culture tells you, if you just try hard enough and become disciplined, yeah, it's fine to believe in a heart power. Just Become a good person and your higher power will be satisfied. The gospel says, nope. There's absolutely nothing you can do to become righteous before God on your own merit. On your best day, you still get an F. You still fail. Culture says, if there's such thing as judgment, your good deeds will outweigh your bad deeds. Don't worry. Gospel says, nope. You're actually an enemy of God. And apart from Jesus, you will be eternally judged when you come before God. Culture says, trust in yourself. And just do good to others. The gospel says, nope. Surrender. Give up trying to be good. You can't be good. Trust rather in the perfection of Jesus. So that by believing that He died on the cross for your transgressions, for your wickedness, you can turn from your sins and enter the rest that Jesus offers you. Be transformed. Become born again. Come into the family of God. Stop trying. And when people hear this, they're offended. Like, what do you mean I'm a bad person? Why do you mean I can't do nothing about it? Yeah, pretty much. All these questions will come up. All these objections will come up. To which there are answers. And the Christian worldview will always come out on top. As best explaining the world that we live in today. Nevertheless, after all that said is done. Jesus said, unless you become like a little child. You will not enter the kingdom of God. What does that mean? Unless you trust. Like a child trusts his loving father. Unless you submit yourself as a small child would submit himself to a loving and caring father, you will not 
see nor enter the kingdom of God. So in this context that the Jewish tradition of good works and rituals and legalism is in play, the message of Jesus to repent of their sins and to trust in Him, that everything they've been learning and reading about in the scriptures is about Him, you can see how that's a highly unorthodox message for them. And it says that they were offended, thinking, who does this guy think he is? And that's a common denominator today, that people are offended. Verse 4 says, And Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor except in his hometown and among his relatives and in his own household. We know that this was actually a, a known proverb in those days, or a variation of that at least. And it's still in use to this day, right? We still use this proverb. Now, we know that Jesus was not surprised at their rejection. But it's interesting to notice how the rejection comes from the outside perimeter, right? Hometown, and then among his relatives, and then around the household. So this should give us insight that the people that are most likely to reject the gospel is people who know you, your own family, your own household, and the sphere of influence that you have among acquaintances and friends. So should we be surprised when our loved ones reject the gospel? No, we should not be surprised. And as difficult as this is, we need to remember two things. One, never stop being a good witness. And two, trust in the sovereignty of God to save. God is able to save. It's not up to us. Verse 5 says, And he could do no mighty work there, except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. So someone could come and grab this verse and say, Aha, you see? Jesus is not omnipotent. There's some things he can't do. It says right there that he could do no miracles. Right? So a couple of, a couple of thoughts on, on that line of thinking. First, let us remember what was the primary purpose of Jesus in his earthly ministry. Mark 1.38 says that Jesus had come to do what? To preach. He didn't say that he came to do miracles and, uh, and great works. Although the miracles and the great things he, he did tangibly, he did those things to validate his message. But it is clear that he came primarily to preach. As a matter of fact, the first words of the public ministry of Jesus are recorded in Mark 1, 14. And what did he say? Jesus said, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Therefore, repent and believe the gospel. Right? So that was the primary Interest, the primary goal of Jesus' earthly ministry, to preach and teach, call people to repentance. Secondly, Jesus said that he came for those who are sick and in need of a physician, and not for those who are well. Ultimately, that truth is most relevant in its spiritual meaning. What does that mean? Well, the people in Nazareth that rejected him, spiritually speaking, did they think that they were spiritually sick and needed a physician to heal their soul? No. Or did they think they were just fine how they were? Yeah, they were offended. At what they were hearing Jesus uh, teach. So accordingly, Jesus didn't come for them. You see that? Jesus did not come for those who say, I'm actually fine. I don't need anything. Interestingly, personally, I've used this in evangelism sometimes. When I'm witnessing to somebody and there's just this really harsh resistance. And if there's a time to interact, a question will come up. Like, well, why would God want to save me? And sometimes I, I tell them, you got to be discerning this. But I tell them, you know what? 
Maybe God doesn't want to save you. And they're kind of taken aback. Whoa, 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 what do you mean? It's like, well, if, if you don't think that you're spiritually uh, helpless and in need of a Savior, like Jesus didn't come for you. Huh. Right? So here, the people in Nazareth, in disbelief, they didn't need him. So, the sovereignty of God and the responsibility of man go hand in hand. They're still responsible for their condemnation of unbelief. Nevertheless, God is sovereign. So Jesus didn't perform any signs and wonders and healings because that's not primarily what he came to do. That's what we've established here. People didn't express need for him. He was seen more of like an anomaly. This guy that grew up here, he left. Some crazy things are going on. We're not really sure, but we don't need him. Don't get out of here. And it says, nevertheless, in the grace and mercy of our Lord, he still healed some people there. Right? In comparison to the masses that were that were coming to him in the in Galilee and Capernaum region, this was as shown by the text, relatively much smaller. But even with unbelief and with rejection and with humiliation and him being offended there by them telling him that he was illegitimate, he still showed his grace and mercy and love and he healed some people. Did they deserve it? No. And this reminds us of yet in the midst of depravity and rejection and rebellion God is so gracious verse 6 the last verse here has says that he marveled because of their unbelief and he went about among the villages teaching there are two times recorded in scripture that say that Jesus marveled because of someone's faith Marveling would be a deep admiration or a feeling of one, what one would say, maybe in our modern terms, when you say, when you experience or see or witness something outrageous, and you're like, whoa, did you see that? Jeez, can you believe what we just saw? That's amazing. It's kind of expressing that type of admiration or, or marveling. There's two times in Scripture. One is here. At the lack of the faith of the people in his own town, Jesus says that he marveled. The other time is in Matthew 8, verses 5 to 13. Let me just read that. It says, When he had entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him, appealing to him, said, Lord, my servant is laying paralyzed at home, suffering terribly. And he said to him, I will come and heal him. But the centurion replied, Lord, I am not worthy to have you come under my roof. But only say the word and my servant will be healed. For I too am a man under, under authority with soldiers under me. And I say to one, go, and he goes. And to another, come, and he comes. And to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard this, he marveled. And said to those following him, following him, Truly, I tell you, with no one in Israel have I found such faith. So apparently the centurion was, was not a Jewish guy. He was a Gentile. And it says that Jesus marveled. Like, wow, look at the faith of the centurion. And by, by the account that the centurion gave him, he understands the issue of authority. He says, I'm in a high position. And when I say something, it's done. And he's telling Jesus, how much more? You, Lord. All you have to do is speak the word and it'll be. And Jesus goes on to say that he's marveled by that faith. And then he says that such people, there in, in the verses following, People with such faith will come and fellowship. They will come and recline at table with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of God. 
And then he says, while the sons of the kingdom, meaning the people that should have believed, will be thrown into outer darkness. And there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Isn't that amazing? It says now that after this, Jesus moved on and kept teaching and preaching the villages. And again, we are told that this is why he came. He moved on. He went and preached and taught in the villages adjacent there. So, we've seen some application already in, in, the, in the verses that we've seen here. But what does all this really mean? Let's, let's, let's bring this home. How does this apply? Well, what about some questions that we might have because of our unbelief? Whether as believers, but especially as non-believers, anybody listening or here today that may not be a believer in Christ, how does that look like? Well, just like the people of Nazareth, they could not deny the evidence, right? In the same way, questions of unbelief today, they cannot deny that the Bible has much wisdom. Many times I've had people who are not believers that they genuinely want to know what I think about a certain situation because they know that, I, and I always tell them that my authority is the Bible. Like I, I have no wisdom of my own. And, you know, graciously, like they acknowledge that I might have something good to say. And they come to me, so the unbeliever cannot deny that the Bible has wisdom. But nevertheless, there's that doubt of, hey, but what about all the other religions? You know, how, how can they be off? Maybe there's, there's some wisdom in them too. How, I cannot just go with Jesus. I mean, what about everybody else? Secondly, the questions of unbelief today cannot deny that they perhaps know a, a professing Christian that genuinely shows the love of Christ and that lives a life that is consistent with their profession. But yet, hey, but what about all those hypocrites that go to church and they're horrible people? You know, so again, bring in an objection. They can also not deny that they perhaps have not lived to being that good person that they should be. But then... Hey, you know, but I can just try a little harder, even though I have fallen short here and there. And maybe, yeah, maybe I should go to Jesus, but ah, I'm just not ready right now. Like, I got to get my act straight first. Right? How many times have we not heard that when we're evangelizing? Or maybe someone would say, well, if God would just perform a miracle, like, I just need a sign. Like, I, I need to see him do something supernatural. And I, then I will believe. Is that true? People say that, but would, do you think they would believe if, if they saw something supernatural? No. Scripture is clear. In the story of, of uh, Lazarus <coughs> and the beggar, you know that um, they were separated by, by this large empty space and... Father Abraham is asked, like, just, like, let me, let me just go back and tell somebody. That way, let me tell my relatives so that they would believe. And what are we told? That, nah, they won't believe. Like, they have the scriptures. They have the, the prophets. Like, let them read that. Because even if somebody is raised from the dead, they wouldn't believe. Jesus was raised from the, from the dead. Did people at that time believe? No. Most of them didn't. So, all these objections really are, are an excuse. And whatever the objection may be at the end of the day that reject Jesus at Nazareth and the modern objections of today in our culture, what is the ultimate reason for rejecting Jesus? That's really the key. Why? Right? We asked towards the beginning, why do people reject? John 3, 18 through 20 gives us the answer. Among other places, but I think it's, it's uh, fairly clear here. So I'll read that. John 3, 18 through 20. Jesus is speaking here. He says, Whoever believes in him is not condemned. 
But whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world and people love the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light lest his works should be exposed. So the common denominator to all unbelief. I acknowledge there is a place for academic and philosophical debate. Absolutely. I, I love that. In which I will always say that the worldview from scripture always comes out on top. As best describing our reality. But nevertheless, at the end of the day, it is not because of intellectual reasons or doubts or criticisms for the church. And mind you, there are many valid criticisms for the church. But whatever the excuses may be at the end of the day, the bottom line is this. People reject Jesus because they love their sin. So what about the application for the believer? For one who is a Christian, a believer, has been redeemed by the work of Christ. Well, for one, it's a reminder of what God saved us from. The breath of spiritual life that has given us the recognition that we need Christ and that we are born again by God's grace alone. But also, perhaps, in our path of sanctification, we keep tripping with particular sins. Why? Because of unbelief. Because of unbelief that Christ will be the only one who will be able to fulfill our needs and our wants and our contentment. We keep believing that we need to go to these other things to be able to be granted that satisfaction. And we have to repent of that unbelief. We could say, well, you know, it's, 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 it's just too much going on, you know, it's overwhelming and that's why I go and get drunk and that's why I go and do this and that and the other. Nope. You're actually not trusting that Jesus can fulfill that necessity, that longing to feel complete. And of that, we should repent. So lastly, we cannot ignore the mighty work that is required for a person to believe. Both in our sanctification path, but also for the, for the non-believer. And that is, that God must act. God must give, God must grant belief. And isn't it odd that those that we think that should believe, those we think that are, geez, like Jesus' siblings, they grew up with Him. How could they not believe in Him? The ones that we think should believe, don't believe. And then the ones that we think would be the last ones to believe, the last that we believe, that we think would be the last to give their life to Jesus, are the ones who end up trusting in Jesus. How can that be? Think for instance, I think two sermons ago, Pastor Kevin preached on the demoniac at Gerasarene who lived among the tombs. He was condemned to live a life being tormented by demons, a legion of demons. He could do nothing to make himself better. Yet, Jesus went to him and delivered him. And the text tells us that that person that, that had been oppressed by demons now wanted to follow Jesus. Have we ever known anyone like that? Where you're, man, that person is at a lost cause. If there was ever a lost cause, that person is it. And then you all of a sudden come to find out, wow, they got saved. <laughs> How can that be? That's the grace of God. That's the intervention of a mighty work of God that is required for us to believe. So what does that tell us? How can we reconcile this paradox that God is sovereign, but yet we have the responsibility to believe? Well, I don't know. But I just know that that's what scripture teaches. 
<clears throat> However, there are some things that are very clear. One, we need to be very diligent in preaching and showing the gospel to others. Be consistent in that. You don't know who God's going to save. Your responsibility is to be consistent and not lose heart. And two, we need to cry out to God for His intervention in saving those that we come across. And I would add, if you today know that you are rejecting Jesus, that you have objections to Jesus, that you have all these questions, cry out to Him. Ask Him to reveal to you. Ask Him to give you faith. Ask Him to make you see your need for His mercy and His forgiveness so that you may repent from your sins and trust in Him as your only Savior. With that, I'd like to close with a quote from a theologian, J.R. Edwards, that I came across while I was doing the study, that I think should really speak to us. And it says, The people of Nazareth see only a carpenter, only a son of Mary, only another one of the village children who has grown up and returned for a visit. The greatest obstacle to faith is not the failure of God to act, but the unwillingness of the human heart to accept the God who condescends himself to us in only a carpenter, the son of Mary. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for the time you've given us to look at your word, to read your word, to reflect on your word. I pray, Lord, that the truths that are found in your word would be as refreshing water to one who is thirsty, Lord. That it would be the words of the powerful God who can speak life into someone who is dead. That your word this morning would be one that transforms us. One that will have the power to save. And the power to persevere, Lord, for those that do know you. I ask, Lord, that you be with us as we have community with each other. And that we will encourage each other, knowing that we need each other. And that we need, ultimately, you. I ask you this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen.
Thank you. You may be seated. Thank you, Gerardo. Thank you, the worship team. What a powerful message today. And one thing that we should ask ourselves, just like this song is, are we living for Christ? And I'm sure many of us can say we are, and many of us can say at times, and many of us can say possibly no. So this would be a good time to reflect on that. And if there's areas of in our life that we need to repent of, that we should. We also want to invite everybody after today's service to come with us to eat, to wish off our brother uh, Robbie, who I like to call up right now, as well as, well as our pastors, uh, to lay hands on uh, Robbie as he goes to Texas. All right, so we'll, uh, we'll pray for Robbie. We're sending him off. He's one of the uh, original members here at our at our fellowship, and uh, we love him very much. We want to ensure that he is sent off with uh, brotherly love, and we also want to ensure that he lands at a solid Bible church wherever he's, he ends up, so uh, even though we'll be divided by distance, we're going to be um, present in, in spirit. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the time that you've given us to fellowship and to know and to live life with our brother Robbie. Lord, we ask that you would mightily use him as he goes to Texas. That first and foremost, he would trust in you. And that he would thank you for the grace that you've shown him. I ask, Lord, that you would uh, provide for him in uh, just in the day-to-day -day means, Lord. For uh, the home he's going to be at, that you would bless that home. For his family that is there, that you would bless them, and that you would use him as, as an instrument, Lord, to, to spread your news, your good news, your gospel, that he would be a light um, in a place of darkness to those that don't know you. And Lord, I pray that you would uh, also remind him that he is your child, and that he is to remain obedient, and that he is to remain accountable. And also, Lord, that he is a father himself that he would remain in touch with his son, uh, and that you would also bless uh, Damien, Lord, as, uh, as his dad goes to Texas, Lord. Um, I ask for now a, a blessing uh, for his trip, and that you would use him, Lord, even in that trip, whoever he comes across with, um, in order to shed your light upon their lives as well. We ask this in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. All right. So, uh, all right, let's go have some lunch. Kevin, thanks for watching. If you have been blessed by this video, please like and share it on social media. And don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel, Acts Reform Fellowship, where we have many more biblical-based sermons and lectures. Click on the bell to be notified below when the new videos are added. Thank you and God bless.